This is all wrong. I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. Yet you all come to us young people for hope. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. And yet I'm one of the lucky ones. People are suffering. People are dying. Entire ecosystems are collapsing. We are in the beginning of a mass extinction. And all you can talk about is money and fairy tales of eternal economic growth. How dare you? So I was wondering whether you thought climate change could be an issue that could unite us all on left and right, moving us beyond debates about C16 to discussions at the UN at Katowice next month, where perhaps humanity might finally discover its global map of meaning. No. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, the first reason is, is that um, I spent a lot of time reading. Uh, I worked for a UN committee for two years on sustainable economic and ecological development and read a very large amount during that period of time and learned a lot, much of which made me much more optimistic than I had been before I read the relevant literature, which was a real shock to me. But the climate change issue is an absolutely catastrophic, nightmarish mess. And the idea that that will unite us is that's, that's, <laughs> that's not going to unite us. I mean, um, first of all, it's very difficult to separate the science from the politics. And second, even if the claims, the more radical claims are true, we have no idea what to do about it. And so, no. And besides, it's even worse than that. Here's, the, here's one of the worst things about the whole mess is, so as you project outwards with regards to your climate change projections, which are quite unreliable to begin with. And the unreliability of the measurement magnifies as you move forward in time, obviously, because the, the errors accumulate. And so if you go out 50 years, the error bars around the projections are already so, so wide that we won't be able to measure the positive or negative effects of anything we do right now. So how in the world are you going to solve a problem when you can't even measure the consequence of your actions? Like, how is that even possible? And, and besides that, well, what's the solution? What are we going to do? Switch to wind and solar? Well, good luck with that. Just try it and see what happens. We can't store the power. Germany tried it. They produced more carbon dioxide than they did when they started because they had to turn on their coal-fired plants again. That wasn't a very good plan. Well, we don't want nuclear. It's like, okay, what happens at night? Ha! Huh, the sun goes down. Well, isn't that something we shouldn't have taken, that we should have taken into account? Well, we've got to flip on the coal-fired plants. Well, so it was a complete catastrophe, and all that happened was the price of electricity shot up. It was like zero utility. So that's, that's not a solution. So what are we going to do about it? Well, we should cut back. We can't consume as much as we, sh as, we, as we are all consuming. It's like, well, maybe, except the data that I've read indicate that if you can get the GDP of people up to about $5,000 a year, then they start caring about the environment, and the environment cleans up, so you could make a perfectly strong case, I think, and a reasonable one, perhaps even a humane one, that the actual idea would be to get everybody in the world who's poor, desperately so, out of poverty as fast as possible, which would increase consumption in the short term, because then they'd start to care about the environment and things would clean up. It's like, okay, well, what are we going to do about global warming? Well, good luck figuring that out. I don't see a solution on the horizon. I look at Bjorn Lomberg's work. I really like Bjorn Lomberg. I think he's a real genius. You can look him up if you want. He took the um, UN millennial goals, there's 200 of them, that's way too many goals if you're serious about goals, by the way, because 200 goals isn't a plan, it's a wish list. You have to prioritize, I'm serious, you have to prioritize, but they won't prioritize because each of the goals has its constituents, and if you prioritize, then you irritate the constituents, and, but if you don't prioritize, then you can't implement the plan. So what Lomberg did was gather a team of teams of economists, multiple teams, some of whom were Nobel Prize winning economists. He had them assemble teams. He had them rank order uh, development goals in terms of their return on investment, all, all of the teams. Then he averaged across the teams and came up with a final list. And, and addressing global warming wasn't even on the list. The, the most fundamental 
he wrote a book called How to Spend $75 Billion to Make the World a Better Place, and that's not very much money on a global scale. Almost everything that he recommended had to do with increased child nutrition in developing, in developing countries. It's like, these things are complicated, man. These are complicated. It's like, well, let's fix global warming. It's like, okay, well, good luck with that. First of all, how are you going to do that? And to think that will unite us, but well, certainly not uniting us so far. So, no. And, and it's just, it's just, it's the kind of low-resolution thinking that just gets us absolutely nowhere. I like what Lomberg did way better. I think it's way more intelligent. So, you know, maybe if you, if you increase child nutrition enough and, and you produce another, I don't know, 10 million geniuses as a consequence of that, and maybe one of them will figure out what to do about global warming. Well, I'm serious about that, you know? It's not a bad thing to increase the total sum of human brain power, you know? And so, it, it, we, we treat these things so lightly. Well, let's fix the planet. Well, we're going to concentrate on global warming. Well, why global warming? Well, because everyone thinks that's the biggest catastrophe. Well, maybe it is, but if you don't have a solution, well, and then what about all those other problems? What are you going to do about them? Well, we'll ignore them because we can feel good about, you know, being concerned about global warming. It's like, I don't, I don't, you know, one of the reasons, there's more trees in the Northern Hemisphere than there were 100 years ago. No one knows that, but it's true, and by a substantial margin. You know why, in part? Because people burned coal instead of wood. It's like everyone says, well, we shouldn't burn coal. It's like, okay, fair enough. What do you want to do, burn trees instead? Because that's what poor people would have done. It's like, coal isn't good. Well, it's better than burning wood. So these things are complicated. So they're, they're unbelievably complicated. And so, no, it's not going to unite us. And we're not going to do a damn thing about it either. So it doesn't really matter. So, well, what are we going to do? You're going to stop, like, having heat? You're going to stop having electricity? You're going to stop driving your cars? You're going to stop taking trains? It's like you're not. You're going to stop using your iPhones? You're not going to do any of that. And no wonder. So, so... No. <laughs> thank you for uh, thank you for that.